This is Ocean to Ocean for Nothing Media, and I'm here with Michael Jeffries today, uh, a non-dual speaker who hosts his own weekly meetings and was recently um, interviewed by Emerson here on the Nothing YouTube channel. Um, actually, Luciana. Oh, it was with Luciana. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. No, I just listened to it, so I should have known that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so this is our first time speaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I heard we have uh, something in common as far as uh, chess. Oh, I I think we probably have very little in common as far as chess. I I I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I I think I, you know, I struggle against playing like your students probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I'll tell you something, Art, it kind of is applicable, and I'll tell you how. When I used to play in chess tournaments, right, like at the Hilton Hotel at LAX here in Los Angeles, I can remember calculating so deeply and intently, I go here, he'll go here, you know, because we're playing for money and prizes and trophies, and I got so lost in that experience that the room would disappear and I would forget that there's 400 people yeah. all around me because, and I would like come out of it. I would like suddenly remember, oh yeah, there's 400 other people in this room with me. But that was, you know, just getting lost in what is because in that moment, the only thing that mattered was the position. Everything else seemed to vanish. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's what people call the flow state, yes? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I've, I've experienced that, you know, making music, writing poetry, making paintings, pro programming code when I'm in a particularly inspired state to do so. Yeah, um, as well as, uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You know, when I interview, are you familiar with Michael Markham? Yes. Yeah, so in my talk with him, I think he said it feels to him like since his shift, he, he says he had a, a night and day shift 10 years ago, roughly in Las Vegas, where he woke up and just the me was gone and there was no separation um, seen any longer. And um, he said that since then, he feels like he's always half in a flow state. Hmm. That's the way he puts it. Yeah. And if you, yeah, I was just curious what you thought, you know, what your experience is like since you, um, yeah, I just listened to your conversation with Luciana and um, how you talked about finding Tim Cliss's book last year, This Deafening Silence um, had a profound effect on you. And so since then or prior to then, I mean, what's your, because you've been, you've been um, holding these meetings for a few years in LA, is that right? Well, um, I, really the, the kind of, um, I would say non-duality is really about a year or two ago, last couple oh. of years. Before that, um, I ran an Eckhart Tolle, it was called the Santa Monica Eckhart Tolle meetup. And as I shared with Luciana, like her and I both, it was Eckhart's book you know, way back in the day, like 2000 or something that, yeah, that got our attention. Oh, yeah, the now, that's all there is. So that was, you know, that's sort of the starting point, I think for, you know, you kind of have to get that, that kind of has to knock you over. You know, when someone points out, well, actually, there's only this, that's what Tim calls it, right? He says, there's just this. Yes. So for some people, are, that doesn't compute, right? They just, yeah, whatever. But for us oddballs, mm -hmm. it's very profound because you realize you've been trying to get somewhere your whole life that me has been seeking. And what you've been longing for is just the simplicity of what is. 
Yeah, beautifully put. So I feel like there's a lot to dive into here and what's come up already. Um, but but before we get into the more of the non-dual stuff, uh, I was just curious, did, did you see Queen's Gambit? What did you think of that? I It's funny. Um, my chess class has picked up. I do a Zoom online after, because I used to teach in schools after school chess to the kids. And as yeah. you know, as we all know, that ended uh, actually about a year ago this time. And um, so the enrollment has been good and the organizers suggested it might've been because of that, because of that Netflix Queen's Gambit. Um, yeah. To be honest, I have not seen it. Hmm. I watched the trailer and the trailer was particularly violent. Um, she was into pills and she was tr yeah. striving so hard to be in. It just had kind yeah. of a dark feel to it. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. You yeah, know, it has that element to it. And uh, honestly, I, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I skipped the whole first episode for that reason. And I skipped past any part because I, I was pretty sensitive to that at the time. I just wanted to see the chess part of it. And um, anyway, just a random question. But yeah, I'm not surprised your students body has increased because that was the number one show on netflix for like right maybe. but as i said to the organizer i go well i don't think it's the kids it's probably she said it's the adults it's probably the parents saw it and then thought oh this would be good for my kid kind of thing yeah yeah definitely now, um now art I'll, I'll just tell you just fyi i did get to meet and hang out with um the kid from searching for bobby fisher which is my favorite chess movie of all time. Have you seen it? I love that movie. I, I, I think it's probably about time for me to rewatch it. I haven't seen it in years, but I love that movie. Yeah. I love everything about it. The music, the kid is literally a one hit wonder because I don't know that that little boy that played Josh Waitzkin in the movie has ever really gone on to do anything else, but he was so natural and so authentic. And it's a true story. There really was a dad used to write for Sports Illustrated, and he began writing articles about his son, who turned out to be the best chess player in the country for kindergartners, for five-year-olds. He was, you know, beating adults from early on. So yeah, searching for Bobby Fischer, if someone's looking for an upbeat. Um, and even if you don't like chess, it's a really good, it's still a good movie, yeah. Okay, great, yeah. And, and Queen's Gambit, I would say, is pretty upbeat overall, um, you know. Just a bit of drama mixed in there. Um, yeah, but I'd say, you know, I, I like throwing these monkey wrenches in these conversations where I know the audience just wants to hear, you know, two hours of us talk about how there's nothing but this. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but like, and I, and I, and I mean, I, I'm in love with that as well. That's why I love these conversations. But I also like to you know, see how we could, I don't know, it's just whatever comes up, comes up, and you're into chess, so it just came up. But yeah, I guess as far as um, chess and the flow state, going back to my question about what Michael Markham said, um, yeah, do you have, do you feel, do you relate to this at all? Do you, does the, the flow state you were in when everything disappears in the room, you know, and like this Bobby Fischer kid experienced and, you know, like, it's like when you're in that flow, does life feel more like that in general now? Or would you not describe it? Or do you? Yeah. No, I would. No, I would agree. Because as you, you know, ultimately there, there isn't a me. I mean, that's, you know, so it would make sense, right? When you're doing your best, you're not there to get in the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I know someone else pointed out to me the other day that I don't know if this is scientifically verified or not, but, you know, they said that in moments of like emergency where like, you know, you have to do something to protect your body or whatever, yeah. you know, that you act on instinct, um, that in those sorts of moments, the first thing to go away is any sense of the me, because it just doesn't serve any function. It would just, you know, the, the immediate response of the body happens and that kind of makes sense to me because, you know, all those experiments we've all heard a million times about how, you know, the thought comes seven seconds or whatever before the person realizes 
they've made a choice so it's like the idea you know yeah and, and and michael the other michael markham he describes that as um you know the the me arises downstream from you know the thoughts yeah, yeah. well we know that's true because you can just look at a newborn a newborn baby hasn't had you know the, the moment it comes out of mom it doesn't know anything it can't it has no sense of a me or couldn't, it takes time for that to set up shop. You know, um, in fact, Tim was just talking about his two-year-old now is uh, just repeating his name, you know, over and over, Harry, Harry, you know, Harry want, you know, because, and I, I actually witnessed this myself. My next door neighbor had a little four-year-old and she was, uh, the grandma was holding up a photo and saying, Eliza, Eliza. And the little girl was pointing at the picture and go, Eliza? And she was like communicating, that's you. And you, so you could see the girl, like the little dawning of like, oh yeah, that's, you know, it was still in the imprinting phase. Yeah, I just heard that, actually just heard that part of the interview with you and Tim as well. Um, yeah, where he was describing his six-year-old is now getting more self-conscious if he asks for him to dance, where when he was four, he wouldn't be so self-conscious. And and the two-year-old, he said, has a very like, you know, just the beginnings of like a me forming. And and you mentioned one of your chess students who, um, you know, you witnessed go from this very innocent state to something that was much more self-conscious and less, you know, f free maybe in a sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I almost wish that I had documented, you know, if you took video of him the first couple semesters he was in my class, there was just a, a, a I mean, he, he just always was smiling and seemed happy and never really said much. It was really, the joy in him was just so, I would go quiet just around him. I mean, I would tease him and, you know, we'd make fun as I said on the video with Tim, you know, I told him if he didn't behave, I would put him in the trash can and, you know, his mom, he's all, yeah, put me in the trash can. And, you know, his mom, mom took a picture of me putting him upside down over the trash can. But that, like I said to Tim, when he came back around third grade, he was already different. Like gone yeah. was the carefree laughter. There was a seriousness. And like Tim pointed out, that's what we all experience is self-consciousness, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm aware that now I'm here and as soon as I'm here, you're there. And so we're different. And now I care about what you think about me. Yeah, it's, it seems to be the necessary function of life in the, of the body. Um, and necessary, not in this, you know, just in the sense of like, you know, it's necessary for a snake to shed skin. I mean, this is just what's happening. Yeah. Like independent of any choice for it to happen, or like like you U G Krishnamurti in this one video on YouTube I really like with him and Byron Katie actually, where he mentions. Um, wait, wait! You said U G Krishnamurti and Byron Katie did a video together? Yeah, yeah. There's a video of the two of them together online. <laughs> and wow! And, and I I would say. Um, yeah, it's it's a pretty wild video that depending on your personal bias of how much you resonate with either of them, you could have a very different perception of because yeah. But 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 the way I view this video, it's one of my favorite videos of UG is um I just think they're both perfectly themselves and in a sense it's a beautiful expression of um the masculine and the feminine and the, you know, as non-duality speakers and, you know, in a way that almost could be triggering because it's, UG is quite rude, you know, I would say. Um, but, you know, if you're a big enough fan of UG, maybe you would think, oh, well, he's telling the truth and she's pussyfooting around. I don't know. But, but no, I think it's an amazing video. I recommend to anyone. The only problem with it is the audio quality is not that great, but mm. um Pretty, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's before she even published her first book, maybe. Wow. It's from like 97, because I think she actually spent like at least 
five to 10 years <clears throat> meeting different people and stuff before she published her first book mm -hmm. after her awakening. Um, yeah, okay, so I got a little off track, but no, yeah, it's a great video. I recommend, um, it's worth describing because anyone watching or listening to this, if you have any interest in UG or yeah, Byron Katie or my description of it, I think you'll enjoy it. It's, it's really interesting. It's mostly UG talking and Byron Katie trying to get a word in, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but, it, it, but it's, it, it, and at one or two points, UG gets quite passive aggressive and I don't like that part, Right. but you know, it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool just to see the different expressions of this, you know, the kind motherly caring ex feminine expression and the very like, no, it's this, no, that's bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Which I love UG. I'm not mocking him. I mean, I, I'm sort of am a little bit, but I love UG so much. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I, you know, yeah. You could just you could imagine what that would be like to be in his company well, and art. You can love someone and still not condone, you know. Yeah. The thing they, you know, UG, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, UG was UG. You know, you you know what you're in for when you sit down with UG. He's, I mean. You know, it's funny. That's what I love about all you guys. You know, everyone doing the interviews, like you are, are so different. You know, I would say your net is much wider. You know, you're open to interviewing. You know, it doesn't have to be strict, quote, you know, non-duality. You're much more. And I think there's a place for all of it, right? It's all a beautiful expression. So Byron Katie and UG are really just different expressions of, well, this. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, what was my point with bringing that up? The thing about UG and that. <laughs> wow, that's funny. I forgot what we were talking about. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, if we just bring it back to this moment and, um, you know, why is this Eckhart Tolle what was the what was the obstacle you know like the old indian saying you know it takes a thorn to remove the thorn so what i get from what you said about eckhart and i've heard from others i i personally didn't really get into eckhart too much until much later by the time i i listened to eckhart not, or, um well i listened to his audiobook a few years ago and it didn't resonate that much um but lately i checked him out again and it really resonated but um, yeah, so, but, 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 I, but I've heard this from a lot of people, this, um, Power of Now experience, which is a very popular book, was like a stepping stone for a lot of people, like a gateway drug to, yeah. you know, the, to the Tony Parsons, you know, yeah. and the misses of the world. So, yeah. you know, what, what was, what was the obs, you know, it gave you a medicine, but what was the obstacle it gave you that then you needed another, you needed to be free of? Yeah, well, do you remember um, I, when I was growing up, there was a commercial, I think it was an aftershave commercial where the, the guy, a hand would come up and slap the guy in the mirror, his face, and he'd say, <laughs> thanks, I needed that. I don't know, I missed that one. That's, yeah, it had like, like men in aftershave and, you know, she'd slap him and he'd go, oh, thanks, I needed that. And so the only way I can describe it here is that like everybody, you know, I grew up here in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley and, you know, took myself to be separate from life and like everyone just tried to do my best. Um, and then The Power of Now was the first book that sort of broke the illusion of a solid past and a solid future that really exists. And so, yeah, I, I like the way you said it. It kind of was a gateway because he still had a me there, but that me would always be happier if it was present in the now. So that's, yeah. But it's impossible. That's sort of why, you know, it's a good start. It kind of can get your attention, but I had to, uh, quote unquote, move past that because there was still a me here trying to get in the present.
Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've never read that book, but um, yeah, I guess last year I listened, I watched these YouTube videos. Um, when he came out with his follow up to that, um, I forget what it's called, A, A New, New Earth. Earth. Yeah. 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 He did this, um, like, he did 10 hours, no, 20 hours of interview content with him and Oprah, and it's all on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I was into yeah. it. That I followed that. Okay, was yeah, hard. yeah. You were deep into it, so you saw that stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it, it okay. So he, so here's my takeaway when I watched this last year, because I'd never seen it before and had never encountered that much of Eckhart in general personally. Um prior to that. And I I sort of had this feeling like I think he's kind of the modern day Ramana Maharshi. In, in the in the sense that I don't feel any, I feel like he absolutely gets this first of all. I, but I also but I think he does this thing that Ramana did, which Ramana was critical of himself for doing at times. Apparently, of he would answer questions at any level of people asking. You know his, you know, and and I think he was probably very intuitive and receptive to where people were coming from and. He could probably sense if they were ready for a very direct pointer, you know, which his his pointer was, um, who are you? Ask who are you? You know, this is a very ancient Indian um, technique or pointer or whatever. And but to those who couldn't, you know, stomach that, who had a very busy mind, they were like, well, I just want to lose five pounds. What advice do you have for me, Ramana? You know, like. Ramana would answer those questions too. And Eckhart answers those questions too. It's why I think he was very suitable for the, that level of fame and the platform of being on Oprah. And, you know, and, and I guess the double side of that coin is, is it better? This is, this is a story I heard from Paul Hederman. I, I haven't found it myself anywhere. So I don't know if it, it's true or not, but I heard this story that um, Ramana's, like some of the students or his devotees at his ashram were like asking amongst themselves if they're ready to be teachers themselves. And then Ramana showed up and they asked him, are we ready to teach Ramana? And he said, he said, yeah, if you want to, sure, but I don't recommend it. And then they said, why not? And he said, because you have compassion. And then they said, what do you mean? And he said, well, your compassion is gonna make you water down this message, mm. Mm. Which, is, which is exactly what Ramana himself did. And I don't feel like that's so it's interesting to hear him be critical, him criticize his own way of talking to people, you know, but he was also very clear where he said, my teaching is silence, you know, and the moment you add words to this, it fucks it up, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's like Tony Parson says the same thing, you know, where he'll say at his meetings, you know, like all these words are not true. Like, don't take, you know, I forget how he puts it exactly, but he's like, none of this is it. Like, all these words are not it. So, but maybe something else will get across. Yeah. You know? The energetic. The res I call it the resonance. There can just, that's really art. That's my only interest. So I don't have a problem with, because I've gone through many, 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 you know, I, Early on, I was into, you know, like everyone, mostly on this path, Adashante, when, you know, he was here in L.A., went and saw him, Rupert several times, Rupert Spira. So, yeah, so I have nothing, you know, you can only, right, Art, you can only, like, wherever you're at is where you're at. So in one moment, somebody could resonate with you, but you know what, tomorrow, that same person may not. Yeah. And that can happen for just, how can you explain that? You just move on. So it's very natural. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, in your talk with Luciana, you mentioned, she asked, what books do you read now? And you said, all your books are in the closet. And I, I, I relate to that. I mean, I, I used to, I think this is a very common, nearly universal story I've heard from a lot of people. You know, I, I used to always look forward to getting a new book on non-duality or Ramana. And um, yeah, and, and that's just gone now. I mean, I, I, 
I, I can't. I just can't read any of this stuff. It, there's no interest. There's just no interest. I, one of the last books I got was Tim Kliss's book, but I really honestly only bought it to support him because he's like a friend kind of, you know, like, yeah. like I just wanted to, you, you know what I mean? Like, but, but when I opened it up, it's like I'd read a sentence or a page and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Though. You know, and that's enough. I can't read more. It's like, like a friend of like, yeah, this person I was friends with like a year ago, he said, you know, I, cause I, I have my own group and at the, you know, which, has a more open format now, which is, you know, featured on nothing a little bit, but we have one once a month there, but, um, and then I have it twice a week as well. Um, yeah. So like, but it's very open and it's all about people expressing and exploring where they're at, what they see. And generally, you know, they're coming from the place that you you're coming from and, you know, and with the resonance, you know, and le less intellectual debate over words and pr stuff like that. But like, I, I started this group, you know, a year or two ago, um, locally, and we would just read Ramana Maharshi. That's all we would do. Or then we would read Nisargadatta. We would just read it. And that was pretty much it. People would ask questions or we'd talk about it, but it was mostly just reading because I felt like that was such a pure transmission really like a resonance in itself from those books. But at a certain point, I don't know what changes. I, I guess the seeking goes away or lessens. Is that, is that how you would put it? Like, why are your books now in the closet? Why don't you read them anymore? I, uh, I want to say that, like you, I loved my non-duality books. In fact, one of my favorite memories was ordering from non-duality press and I used to review non-dual, I think there's still a review, oh God, it's a, a Eckhart's Power of Now somewhere, a long review, but um, he threw in, um, what's his name, who, run, who used to run non-duality press, him and his wife. Um, he threw in a free extra book as a surprise. So I think I ordered three, but four came in the box. And funny enough, Art, uh, it was a book about his trout last, the final few years of UG Krishnamurti by his assistant. Right. You know that book? Is that, is his name Lewis? Yeah, it has a picture of a chair in the back of UG on the cover. You see his back, he's standing in front of a building and there's just an empty, I think, red chair. Yeah, I, I haven't read the book, but I've listened to his interview um, with Rick Arthur like three times probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I'm right there with you. Like, can you imagine when I opened the box and he had surprised me with that free? Wow. Yeah, it was like Christmas. I'm like, wow, not only do I have three. And I agree, they were like meals. You know, they were like tasty morsels that I was gonna dive in and get something out of. Oh, surely this book will have, you know, those the most coveted answers. And that's kind of what happened was I could see the futility of the seeking. I could see that the answer was not in the words because the words suddenly, and this was nothing I did, the words in the books felt dead. They didn't have the aliveness that the moment itself had. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, I can relate to that. Yeah, I, I think um, sort of recently I had this, you know, thought come to me that it's like my own heart is my teacher now, you know, there, and I think everything leads us back to ourself, you know, that this, you know, one, one measure of a true guru for anyone who goes the guru path, you know, and is that they would have to say in one way or another that you, that you and the guru are the same, you know, or this, the saying in India, God, guru, and self are one. So whatever you're putting, whatever you're projecting onto a God or God or the guru, all of that is your own beauty, your own light, your own liberation that you're seeing in them. Just like when you fall in love, like all of the brain chemistry is happening in you, all the you know, it's like you think it's the other person that's giving you something, but it's it's not. It's a trick from nature, I guess, but it's it's a beautiful trick. 
And yeah, but it's all within, like the body, literally. Yeah, that is that is really profound. Just to sit and realize, Art, that every thought you've ever had about another person was happening in you. Yeah, yeah, my my friend Leonard, who um, yeah, he does some interviews here for nothing too. He, I was watching his interview he did with um, Anna Brown yesterday. I got halfway All right. through. Yeah, it. Leonard Leonard B. I think his last name begins with a B. Biscara. Yeah, he he's he lives in the Philippines. Yeah, and um, really sweet dude. And he um, yeah, in part of his interview with Anna Brown, he showed her a picture that he drew. It was really beautiful, really incredible, profound. Like if he writes a book, he should put that in it. And it's this really cool diagram of like an eye looking out at the world and it's showing the world and people in it. And like inside of the eye is like a camera, like a movie camera projecting, you know, what it's seeing. And, <laughs> and then there's all these lines going back and forth from the eye to the world, asking these questions of, you know, is it, what's the source? Is it here, is it here? <laughs> yeah, boy, I love it. Um, it is, it is. well, I, I think I heard you talking about it in one of your interviews. I mean, it is the cosmic joke. You're playing, this is a joke on yourself. The, the, self, the, the illusion is none of this is you. That's how you start out with separation that there's me separate from the world. And non-duality says not to. And the me can't hear that. The me can never hear not to, right? Because I'm already me. So if I'm already me, and then there's a world right there, there's no way I can hear not to. But that doesn't make not to the reality. Just because I can't hear it doesn't mean it's not so yeah well well on the topic of the cosmic joke i'd like to respond to that and then respond to this not to um sure. you. um so yeah I, I think that when i talk to younger people who are interested in this you know i'd say the majority of them honestly like seem to have found this related to jim carrey you know, as far as the cosmic joke goes, hmm. Jim Carrey seems to be the new, you know, he's not a spokesperson for non-duality, but for those who um, have ears to hear what Jim Carrey was saying a few years ago, I think he's gotten more chilled out. Kind of, kind of like what you, yeah, can you imagine? You were saying this to Luciana about how you went through a phase where you had to tell everyone about this and then that just kind of went away. Like, so can you imagine going through that and being like, a celebrity like that and at award shows and you're just saying oh my god i that's hilarious i know, hilarious. I know just what you're talking about i saw him do it and I, yeah it, it didn't come off i didn't feel it came off too well because it was it felt very dogmatic yeah so it doesn't speak to everyone for sure but some people who are thirsty for that kind of message will hear it in what he's saying and and he's you know he's a big fan of tony parsons and stuff like that you know he, he's he's totally tuned into this apparently I, I, he may be watching this video who knows well but can i make it can i sorry to interrupt can i make tell you a just insert a quick little story about yeah. jim just so if we move on so i got to meet jim and eckhart at a theater here in beverly hills many years ago like i don't know t at least 10 years ago and um it was an all day, you know, one of those spiritual events that have speakers all day long. And then Eckhart was the closing speaker, but everything ran late. So Eckhart ended up not coming on till one in the morning, believe it or not, in this theater in Beverly Hills, California. And so before Eckhart comes out, they sent um, Jim out to introduce him. And it was hilarious. Because when he, you know, Eckhart has that little chair and the table with the watch on it and water or whatever. So, of course, Jim being Jim comes out and starts sort of mocking Eckhart. Like he sits in the chair and he starts pulling faces and, you know, ringing the, like he's going to ring the bell. And then, and then 
as he's then he gets up and he jumps into he just does this whole shtick. I'll cut it short. Eckhart ends up walking out behind him, and he doesn't know it. Is the gag. So there he is making, and Jim's acting like Eckhart, walking like Eckhart, you know, mi mimicking him. And then he turns around and Eckhart's standing there. And I got to tell you, Art, Eckhart didn't need to say a word. It was so damn funny seeing Jim get busted by Eckhart for Jim making fun of Eckhart. It, it brought the house down. And it, 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 was, it was great. And, you know, so I think Jim even though he's world famous and has, you know, tons of money, like all of us, that doesn't matter if you're a seeker. And in a way that's even more disillusioning because you've had the millions, you know, you've had all the women, if you're a guy or whatever, you know, you've had the adoration and you're still empty at night when you put your head on the pillow, when there's no one around that gnawing sense of something. And honestly, that was, that was for me, uh, are, I know I've kind of gone off here, but that sense of something not being right, that kind of became my drumbeat. Something felt off about life and I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, I hear you. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to respond about Eckhart and then you're going to respond about the cosmic joke. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm making notes as we're going. <laughs> we'll see. I'll probably wind up writing it more things to go back to than we will. But um, yeah, that thing you just said about the... Um, how did you just put it? For you, there was this sense of things not being right. Something was off about life and I couldn't put my finger on it. Okay, good. Maybe we'll come back to that. Or maybe that's all that needs to be said about that. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, the thing I was gonna say about Jim Carrey, um, yeah, just the cosmic joke. Um, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen Jim Carrey talk about this, the only video I really recommend, I think is just a brilliant little speech he gives at some Golden Globes ceremony from 2016 i think and um it's so good it's so funny and you know like i'm not going to do the whole bit but people could look it up but one part of it is he says um you know and this isn't really the joke but it's just this little tag at the end of it where he says like he's i'm not saying you know i'm saying i'm not saying that just because if you zoomed out to the level of like you know, our solar system alone, you wouldn't be able to spot, you know, you know, like if you zoomed out, you wouldn't be able to spot the earth with the naked eye, or if you zoomed out to the galaxy, you wouldn't be able to spot, you couldn't see earth, you know, but the, but what we're trying to do here is very important, very important, you know, to, you know. Um, yeah, no, but he says this profound thing that I feel like is really beautiful. That's pretty much what you just summarized that he says, you know, he wishes everyone could get all of the fame and money they could ever want so that they could realize that doesn't bring happiness. Yeah. And that the happiness is already always there underneath. You know, um, as Rupert says, you know, you are the happiness. Um, I think Romana said that. You know, sometimes people get annoyed that I reference people in quotes and things. It's just how my brain works. I mean, I'm, I'm also just exploring, there's just this like emergent, ever emergent expression here. And, and I really like, um, I like referencing things and quoting things, not to sound smart or anything like that. It's, I don't really care about the knowledge and I'm totally okay with things being challenged or disagreed with, even if it's by Ramon or whoever. It's just, um, I don't think anything's original. You know, like UG would like often complain about people parroting, you know? And then there's this like quote from some filmmaker, maybe from Picasso or something of, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And I, I just feel like that's life in a way. Like everything, everything has variations to it. It's like, Everything is similar, but not the, nothing is the same on this level of apparent separation. Like, 
snowflakes all look the same from afar. And when you zoom in, no two are alike out of, you know, kajillions. So that's a totally different topic, but yeah, yeah. is there anything? Well, yeah. I, I've heard Tim say that, and I would agree that UG also said that what I'm saying is no different than a dog barking. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and what he mean, and he, yeah, and people, and he didn't mean that in a way, um, like, that it, there's something wrong with it. It's like a dog barking is beautiful. It's like, it's just natural. It's like a baby crying or wanting its mother, you know? It's like, this is just, you, you know, like, like in Indian philosophy, they call it, you know, um, the natural state. You know, they have this word sahaja, which just means natural. Sahaja samadhi. So samadhi is like the transcendent, one with the universe, no thoughts, no self, blah, blah, blah. And, but the Sahaja Samadhi is like the ordinary Samadhi. It's like the everyday, always on. So, yeah, I mean, th this, this barking of the dog is just like, it's like whatever is happening through the character, this is life just happening as this apparently, you know, according to our brains, according to the way our brains have been conditioned. And so in a sense, none of it's original. It's like, it came from your parents. They taught you and in, in their genetics and we all life on earth, apparently all animal life has a common ancestor in a sponge. There's a sponge that existed, you know, millions and millions of years ago that we all share DNA from. And out of that, somehow, there's all this yapping about nothing existing, you know? Well, I think art, at least for me, the, the quote, you know, my words are no different than a dog barking, is pointing out the meaninglessness of all words. Yeah. that you don't give any significance to a bird, like you said, a bird chirping is beautiful on its own. It doesn't, just that, you know, it can stop you in your track if you sit there. And I, I, I've, you know, I'll sit here and open my door and the birds will be chirping and you can look at them and like, where is that chirp coming from? Yeah, I mean, yeah, what does the chirp mean? I mean, on one level, it means like, stay the fuck off my branch, you know? <laughs> like, this is my branch, my branch, my branch, you, you know? So, <laughs> you know, and the dog barking, it's similar. It's like, you know, why do we speak? You know, what's the meaning of it? I mean, on one level, you know, this is what, psychology is about and you know anthropology and biology and evolutionary you know all this psychology and biology like all that stuff has its place like you know Stephen Walensky called it multi-dimensional something or another it's like multiple levels and and I know and that's a taboo concept for a lot of radical non-duality type lovers out there but but, but when I say that, it's like, well, you love your kids, you love your spouse, that is its own level. I mean, ultimately there are no levels and that's just a concept that has no real meaning. But at the level of like, you know, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, like, like Jim Newman will say how he doesn't use Advaita speak. You know, he thinks that's kind of absurd. If you always have to say, you know, like, this apparent body or whatever, you know, whatever. It's like, we can just talk like regular people. And I would even go as far to say that it's all included. That's the thing. It's like, it's everything and nothing. So even if you wanted to go on a tangent and like write a book about the me the apparent meaning the of, you know, a bird chirping or, you know, your own journey 
on a level that's more like character based or psychology based, you know, it, that's all included, you know, in how could anything not be included, you know, but, but I guess the problem lies is a lot of people they come from this background, I guess we all do, we come from a background where you're always looking for something to make things better. And non-duality is really seeing that things are the way they are. And there's freedom in that, that wanting to make things better for a me that doesn't exist can perpetuate suffering. And at the same time, like getting a back massage is going to feel good before and after awakening, you know, whether there's a me there or not, getting a back massage is going to feel good to the body, you know, and, and how far does that extend? That's something I'm exploring on a personal level, like with an, a not knowing perspective, like a beginner's mind, if I can manage it, mm -hmm. if that's, if I, you know, because it's just, yeah, because I, 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 I think this is where our individual expressions shine, is in our own experience. You know, like I experience Kundalini and stuff like, the, you know, and energy stuff sometimes. Other people don't, but, may, but they experience things that maybe I don't, the way they describe emptiness or, or it could be many things, you know, but that's the point. Like UG said, to parrot him for a sec again, UG said that, you know, like if you compare like a rose with a sunflower, like which is more beautiful? You know, how could you say which is right? You know, but then he, but then he says, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says, whether you have a preference or not, that's another story. Yes. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Our, I've seen the birds have, uh, like you know how airplanes get in fights you know the, the german and the american air from you know i've seen oh, yeah. birds attack each other like you said if there's a nest or a branch that it's guarding and another bird comes in its vicinity it will attack and it will let it be known like you said through its chirping it's aggressive that it doesn't want you here so that's the paradox of this message Everything is completely meaningless, and yet meaning can appear. Yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, the way it, the way it appear, what what appears to happen for me is, you know, since this, whatever, I don't even have a word for it, but gradual shift, sudden, sudden, sudden awakenings followed by gradual cultivations. Yeah, since all of this has been happening, there appears less and less story, you know, but it's not like a light switch where all the wiring of a lifetime in my neural circuitry just disappeared. Like, no, like, you know, it's like, it's like, that's where the, the that's where this, this is a Buddha saying, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation. And to me, that makes more sense because there is a sudden awakening. And in fact, I think there could be multiple sudden awakenings. Um, Jim Newman has said as much, that he's had at least two. Um, I don't think he'd call it that. So I, I, I apologize, Jim, for the language I'm using here. I don't want to misrepresent as well. But, but he, you know, but he described the energy in his contracted energy in his body going away. I would call that an awakening of sorts. And, um, and then he said, years after that there was a there was a second apparent happening mm -hmm. you know where where then he realized that um he didn't need to be happy and yeah. that was like a yeah. even bigger boy that i think you identified are one of the carrots for the me seeker is this <laughs> illusion that once i get there once i cross that goal line you know like a football you know, has to cross the goal line. The me envisions that all will be, you know, bliss. Yeah, and it, and it can't be. It's like, like somebody asked Nisargadatta, like, can I always just be in bliss? And he said, no, he'd probably kill you. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I think maybe that's what it meant in the Bible. I remember those curious Bible verses about like, because I went to like a Christian high school. I, I wasn't really raised with the Bible, but 
I studied it in high school, funny enough, but as a class, <laughs> but, um, mm-hmm. but it, it was like, um, yeah, all these Bible verses about like, if you see the face of God, you die, you know, in the old Testament, it's like, you know, if, if you're witnessed, if you look directly at an angel, you'll die. You can't yeah. handle it. Scary. I, I think that, yeah, it's scary. I mean, I think that's such a great metaphor for how scary this is to the separate self and mm. also for the need for a gradual cultivation. So going back to that for a sec, like my own experience of this gradual cultivation followed following a sudden awakening of a certain level of dramatic, you know, experience. Like it's, it manifests as less story, less attachment, more, l- more ability to just let things go and not be it, not be it, it. It's really kind of as simple as that. And yeah, at a deeper level, you could see that there's no separation and there's no me. Like those are things I don't question anymore. In fact, I, I don't really remember the feeling of a me. It, 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 it kind of sounds absurd to me now. Like I, like at a certain point, the word seeker sounded totally absurd to me. I couldn't even conceive of what it meant anymore. Hmm. Like, which I, I hope that doesn't sound like arrogant or something. Cause it's like to anyone who feels like they're a seeker, like, you know, right on. There's a lot of things you could feel like you are and identify with, but I just, it, it's like, yeah. Because at the same time, the seeking is always there. You don't, like the body doesn't lose seeking. It's just, you realize that's not knowable and you're not it. You're not something that could be put in words. And so the body is gonna seek a sandwich. It's gonna seek sleep when it's tired. You know, seeking eternal bliss is just, you know, that. yeah, I don't know, I mean, I don't know about that one. That, that's a really curious one to me. But yeah, Nisargadatta said, if you're trying to be like in ecstasy all the time, you would just die. Well, you know? our, if you look at the body, right, right now, if you just look at our body, neither one yeah. of our bodies is seeking bliss. That would be the me. The body, yeah, the, the body's content to just sit. The body doesn't have any pro. It's. Yeah, I mean, you're talking biological stuff. Sure, if somebody ran up with a gun, you would your body would move, like you'd find yourself reacting, or if there was a fire. So we're not talking about the natural safety that's built into all organs, even a flower. You know, everything will move away from perceived harm and toward pleasure. But the idea that this moment is not enough, that it it, it should be better. That's all the illusory me. That's all the story of should and shouldn't. And it's all just happening, you know, in the mind. And I don't even use the word mind, but it just seems to be something that's there until it's not, you know, until suddenly it's like, and for me, Art, I'll tell you what, it was more like, I did it. I don't really care if you feel like a me. It's just a feeling. So there's a sense of a me there. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that was beautiful, Michael. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, I know it, it, it's funny, like this conversation has to be a performance of some sort in a way. I mean, life is like that. You know, Marlon Brando, when he was asked about acting, what's his secret? He would say, everyone's a perfect actor already. Everyone's acting, playing parts to their spouse, their friends, you know, different times of the day, they'll change. That's all acting. That's all acting is. And, you know, because when you say stuff like that, Michael, I mean, it, it, you know, I want to continue this conversation, but honestly, you know, on a personal level, like those types of things just make me want to end the conversation because it's, you can't go anywhere from there and you would, you don't want to. It's really just already whole. It's already, you're right. The body is fine. There's no need for anything other than this moment of what it, whatever is, whatever's happening right now is enough. 
Yeah. And there's a freedom to be able to say whatever, you know, the me is so used to censoring itself. Oh, I hope I don't offend. I hope that I say the right thing. And, you know, Tim has been talking about this as well, is that uh, he was saying yesterday at his uh, Zoom meeting that um, he's been getting, he's, someone's told him he's, he's been getting a little angry lately. <laughs> right? Oh, you seem angry. Really? Hmm. You, know, you know? And um, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's in yesterday's uh, Zoom meeting. And um, he just shrugged. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's like, and I kind of get what he means because um, I know like there was people that you would be in touch with me pretty obsessively, like emailing and texting. And I got tired of it and asked them to stop uh, multiple times and they didn't. And I thought, well, I can't just not respond. That would be so rude. But so I continued to ask them to please don't text me. You know, we have cloud, pictures of clouds here too. Thank you, but no thanks. And finally, I sat with it, uh, Art. I just sat with it. And I realized the arrogance of, of, my, of the me. My, the arrogance was, oh, so you don't think you can just say goodbye, in other words, just leave it, because somehow they couldn't get along without you? And I realized that was so bogus. They'll be fine. I, it was so presumptuous of me to think that I couldn't really just speak my mind that somehow, well, you know, I'm, you know, that whole spiritual thing of, well, what, it's just what's happening. It's annoying. It's annoying me, but it's just what is. No, I just said, no more. I'm done. And I'm so happy about it because now I'm not getting harassed anymore. I was able to be honest and there was no, they don't need to talk to me. They, they'll find someone else talk. They were bored. And so they were using their boredom, me, to fill up their day with wanting my attention. So arrogant of me to think that they need that. They'll be fine. Everything is fine. Everything is inherently fine. And, you know, nothing needs, no, that's, this is it, Art. This is probably the hardest thing. Nothing needs to happen. Absolutely. And yet, yeah, happen, and yet happening happens. So this is the part where you're talking about. So now there's such freedom and yeah, let's have a Zoom. You know, let's chat, let's go out, let's do, you know what I mean? In a way you're wide open now because everything doesn't have such great meaning to you that it's so life and death. It's just, well, it becomes more like play. Yeah, yeah, it's more like play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, a friend of mine, he, he used this word freedom the other day and I asked him, what did he, I asked what was new with him? And he said, he's feeling like this word freedom. And I said, well, or he's been having a, epiphanies around it. And I said, what do you like what? And he said, well, you know, he has this ex partner, some kind of rocky relationship with and, you know, um, the freedom to not reply exactly like you just said where before there was a sense like a need to. And, um, you know, this, yeah, I, the way Paul Hederman puts this really resonates for me as far as, you know, the action figure travels lighter. Yeah, that's perfect. It, for me, that nails it. Because, uh, you know why, Art? Because it kind of dismantles all the illusions that me has about and just says, everything will be the same. Your life will still be, you know, how it is, but there'll be a lightness. And that lightness is underrated by the me, you know? The me doesn't see, oh, lightness, that's not bliss. I want, you know, the full, the full Monty. You know, lightness sounds sort of like, you know, like, you know, how when you buy something and it says diet, they have the regular and the diet, you know, you tend to want the regular because diet feels like it's going to miss, it's not going to have everything you want. You know, you yeah. want the full thing. But I'm yeah. telling you, when the lightness pervades everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned the performance and acting stuff earlier because, you know, <laughs> as an artist, I want this, um, I don't actually want the conversation to go silent for too long. Not this conversation. Um, in my own groups, we do that sometimes and it's amazing. Um, and in private conversations, I do that with people, but just... Yeah, it's a preference, which is just as okay as for that not to be the way it is. It's okay either way. Um, and there is no either way. Whatever is flowing through the body, through the whatever, the brain, the body, it, it's all just, you know, the only way it can be. It's utterly unknowable for one thing. It's totally insubstantial and meaningless, but it also is full of all the meaning, all the beauty, all the vibrancy. Mm. It, it... That's, well, now it's my turn. That was lovely. And because and my ears heard you describing everything and nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's why these conversations, yeah, there's no why, but <laughs> th th this is a, a way of sort of expressing why it seems like these conversations are even possible and beyond that, actually very enjoyable to take part in and to listen to for those who are interested in it and those who aren't, that's fine too. Totally unnecessary. And, but the beauty of it is the dance. It's the flowing between, you know, like the nothing and everything. But, you know, as well, Nisargadatta said, you know, he, his life flows between, you know, the wisdom of there being nothing and the love of everything. And it's just flowing between. Well, let me ask... And, let me ask you, Art, why do you do these interviews? Why do you like to do them? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm, uh, I've been told I'm a very social person. That's how I'm wired. Um, so I love to talk to people. If I'm not doing these interviews, I'm talking to somebody about this who's a friend pretty much every day anyway. Um, and that could change too. It's not like something I'm, a, I feel like I need, but it, I just, there's been this really beautiful thing of meeting people through this kind of, yeah, since, you know, the COVID times, especially through Zoom meetings, I've made a lot of new friends who just, it's like a similar interest and, and, and it's really that resonance. It's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a passion in the character that that's just you know it it would be it feels like it'd be more effort to not do it than do it because it's just there's a flowing passion for it the same way i've there's been a passion to make music and art over the years for this character yeah it's a dog barking michael <laughs> but what a beautiful noise And so that's, you know, our, that's one of the things that, um, you know, when somebody comes on to like Tim's meeting and starts asking question after question and people get a little rambunctious, you know, in the Zoom, the one thing I really resonated with Tim was that he didn't see that person as a bother. Like he understood people were fidgety and people were like, come on, come on, you've asked the same question, you know, you won't go away. But I, I sat there and I was like, look how loving Tim's being. And I realized this because he was seeing somebody in pain. That's all he saw. He saw someone in front of them saying, look, I'm really suffering, help me. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I guess Tim's character and his story, like, you know, could relate to that form of suffering, of the seeking. You know, I, and so he's in a unique position to just naturally, you know, talk to someone like that. Right, but what, um, was, what, what I noticed, Art, was that he was seeing it completely differently than, a, right? It wasn't that person was being annoying or they didn't get it. It was- Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right. suffering so badly that they don't care how they come off. They're not interested in what you think of them. They're suffering. And by God, you, you say you have the answer. You give me that answer. And I just fell in love. Like I got, you know what I mean? Like you can sense, oh, they're in a lot of pain there. And here I am sitting there going, now we should shut up and let someone else have the turf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I... I guess for me, I, I just love the drama of those things. I, I, I love the, I love the play of it. You know, it's, to me, it's like a play. It is play. And, and as long as everyone is um, being respectful, considerate um, of each other as a human. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I enjoy those sorts of interactions in a way. I, I see other people get frustrated by them. And the frustration to me seems like quite often there's other people who are really intensely already frustrated. They're like, no, shut up so Tim could tell us the answer. Like you're you're blocking the path. Like Tim's right. about to tell us what this deafening silence is, you know? <laughs> shut up so we can hear what the silence is, you know? Yeah. Like, so it's like everyone it's like that person maybe it might be more bold and they're taking center stage that which might be you know from my perspective might be due to their personality their wiring you know or maybe just how intense their seeking is as you say and the suffering that comes from it yeah I mean but regardless it's all just play you know like I mean, and I don't mean that in a way to patronize what's happening or appears to be happening. I mean, if the suffering is really intense around seeking, then, you know, I mean, my heart would go out to that person, you know, I, I, for me, so I, I recently like had a conversation with a friend of mine who I, I met this past year named Maisie Upson, and she had a traumatic brain injury seven years ago that led to um, her shift of perspective with all of this mm. um over a course of like a lot of physical and psychological and emotional trauma of the recovery process of a traumatic brain injury and yeah and that that conversation will be up by the time this one is it's not up as of the recording of this conversation but um yeah and and so my story feels more similar to hers than tim's mm. so when I hear people talk about the suffering of seeking, I don't remember ever experiencing that. Mm. What, like, what I remember is just suffering from life, suffering from attachment to things in life, um, injuries and losses and, you know, just different things that I wanted or thought I needed just not happening or going awry and, and the suffering from that, which in a sense is seeking, I'm seeking, you know, like, you know, fame, money, the right partner, whatever, you know, like peace, you know, good, you know, whatever, healing, psychologically, all these types of things, safety, security, like, like, I guess, you know, and now it's like, I still have all the same problems, you know, but there's, but there's more, there's less story about it. I don't feel like I know what problems I have anymore other than like a month ago, it was like, you know, there was like the biggest blizzard, like a blizzard came through Texas and everything shut down and it didn't have running water for like almost a week. And, you know, like all these like problems that, you know, just come up that could be scary for the moment and then you adapt or, you know, as best you can and all that. It's like, but there's less story around it. And that's the best way I could describe it. So for me, when I found non-duality, it was like the escape hatch to the suffering that was already, had already just like um, made my life a living hell, more or less. And it wasn't like, it didn't, it's not like something you could use, but 
like, so I can't really explain it or suggest it to anyone. It's like you said, you know, if this me drops away or whatever that never was there, like, you don't do that. You don't surrender it. It's like surrender happens. The, the contracted energy goes away or it doesn't. It's, it's like this happens. And, that, and, and that's just the most honest way of putting it. Yeah. Because people who, people who say otherwise that, oh, if you do this, that, and the other for X amount of time, it's going to happen. It's like, maybe, I don't know. Or how do you know? How does anyone know what's going to happen? Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to give you a glimpse. I'm going on some tangents now, but into my own story, there's more relief from suffering that came through seeking than suffering from seeking. I, I, because I encountered this early on, like the person who introduced me to Ramana Maharshi, I, I saw the tremendous suffering that he had around trying to get what Ramana was talking about and not being sure if self-inquiry was working or if he was doing it right. And, and I never got it. I never got why he was so stressed out about it. I was like, you know, just who am well, I? Because he, he wanted to get it and he didn't feel he had it yet. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then at a certain point, it's like, okay, well, then that's what's happening. I mean, you know, Nisargadatta said, I, I, I love, yeah, I, I love these quotes. I, I, I'm grateful for all these other humans, just like you and me, that talked about this stuff in recent decades. People have been talking about this for thousands of years. Like, but yeah, Nisargadatta, he said, you know, when the fruit is ripe, it just falls on its own. Yeah, exactly. And he also, and he also said, if you're listening to this, if you're if you're already resonating with this and you're buying these books, listening to these le videos, conversations, your head is already in the tiger's mouth. Like, just relax. It's going to eat you. It's going to eat your head. Just relax. It doesn't matter when. Just chill out. Wait, you're telling me a tiger is going about to eat me and I'm supposed to relax? I think it already did eat you, Michael. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. This is the so, this is the afterlife, Michael. <laughs> so that's the nothing. There is nothing to do. That's the that's the message. Well, I'm just saying that's the part, right? That you know, you'll hear Jim talk about. There's not. There's no. Because the me, that's the uh, paradox, right? Well, I feel like a me, therefore, what can I do to not feel like a me? If nothing to do resonates, great. If doing this, that, or the other resonates, equally great. Nice. Nice. Exactly. Because that's what's happening. And so if you feel like picking up a book or you feel like watching a particular book, see, the thing is... <clears throat> But, but Michael, of, Michael, just, Michael, just to be clear for those listening, I'm, I'm not saying, and I'm not saying in a hidden way that there's a hierarchy there, that doing nothing is better than doing a practice or reading a book. I'm absolutely saying whatever resonates for you, great. Because like, that's the flow of life. Like there is no you, there's life appearing as this. And if the life appears to be inspired to read another book, that's great. If, if the life is inspired to do nothing or to listen to ten, dozens of hours of people talking about doing nothing, that's great. Like, like when you said that, like when you said the thing about nothing, it, it resonated. It felt like an arrow in my heart. Like it just feels so beautiful and electric. And w when I first started to really resonate with the way Jim spoke, it, what he, I don't even know if it's what he said, or but my it, my whole body would just feel electrified. I wouldn't be able to go to sleep at night if I listened to it too late. It would, it was just like so. Yeah, so I I don't know. That's just my experience. I mean, so trust your own experience. Whoever's listening to this, your own experience is life flowing through in this in the way it is for you, and comparing the way that's happening for you to all these other people is kind of in my opinion like i don't know like it does it's it's that's something that seems to me like like a, an obstacle or like a yeah like it's like the the the, the rose trying to be a dandelion i mean 
be a rose or be grass, be whatever, you know? <laughs> so the feeling that there was something off going back to that has that gone away or is that something that's turned into something else or how do you view that now and how did that change well it was the, it was the trying to escape from, from this, right. if I can put it as simply as I can. There was this, this was, what's happening right now is never good enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, I've actually never read anything by Byron Katie. I, I, I like her work thing. I've, I've done that a little bit. Um, I find it a useful therapeutic tool, honestly. Um, and, but what I really like is just the title of her book, Loving What Is. Yeah. I just love that sentence. I love that title. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I, don't, I feel like I don't have to read the book. I feel like the title says it all. Like, love what is. Well, Loving what is. Just to give a practical example, I don't know if you can hear the garbage truck outside, but there's yeah. a garbage truck now and there's no urge here and there probably you know would have been a few years ago oh i wish that wouldn't have happened or you know like luciana and i had the leaf blower um during our <laughs> interview which she thought sounded like bells so cute but now there i noticed as you were talking i was aware of the garbage truck but there was no longer the impulse that it shouldn't be happening Yeah. And and if and if an impulse does arise that like oh I don't like that or whatever or I want to do something about it that's equally okay. Exactly. And that's I think very good. I think that gets misunderstood because now the window is closed, but if it wasn't I would get I would have gotten up and closed it. So you'll find the body will do what the body does, if you get a cut, you'll find yourself heading to wash it out in the sink and then put a Band-Aid on it. It's just, you, like you said earlier, it's the body has this natural, you know, self-preservation that it, it just seems to know. And somehow we overthink it. You know, we start to put it in mind rather than staying with the experience we tend to go into story. And I noticed that, and I guess we don't have time today to go into it, but I noticed that's one way that I had avoided dealing with emotions was by thinking about them rather than being with them. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Because they're night and day, right? Our, the thinking was, oh, when's this you know, headache going to go away? When is this anxiety? When is this annoyance going to leave? You know, that was the thinking. Oh, I don't feel happy in the moment. How do I get that to change? What do I have to do to make that not be? So there was a constant putting out fires to try and have this imagined experience rather than just allow everything to be as it is. So much simpler. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, this, the way that I see this is even if there is thinking about the emotion and a story being created, the point at which all of that is just accepted as what is happening like like that like that could be at the level i'm just gonna say apparent level or whatever but so so there's the level of the emotion and you could just be with the emotion you could be with the physical sensation in the body with no story 
But then let's say there's a story that feels like trying, you can't resist it, it's just there. So you could be with the story. And then maybe even further out there for, you know, very analytical mind as most are, you know, it, maybe there's a story about the story not being right or being like, oh, maybe even like you're in a non-dual, you know, in whatever, you, you've read all these non-dual books and now, so now you're at this point where part of your mind, despite what you're trying to do is just beating yourself up and making yourself feel worse, thinking like, oh, God damn it, I'm thinking about this story, about this emotion, you know, like, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, how this emotion doesn't, I need to be with this emotion, but I can't, it's like, it, it's like layer on top of layer on top of layer of thinking and judging and, but yeah, at whatever point you can just embrace what is happening, even if that's judging yourself for thinking about an emotion, there's a softening then, there's a relaxation. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's what's happening. Yeah. And that's gonna, and that's gonna, and, and like my friend Harvey says, you know, like it's gonna happen until it isn't. The only thing I would add to that, just a little very caveat, just a small one though, but is that there is a difference though between stories and emotions. Sure. Because this, the emotion, however it's feeling, it is. The story doesn't really have anything to do with the emotion if you actually are with it. Well, yeah, I, I mean, so like, let's say I have like, you know, a girlfriend and, and somebody says something rude to her or she cheats on me or, some, or, or she dies. It's like there's an emotion in my body that's connected to a story, and they and then there's and they and it's all it, intricate. Is it is it connected to the story? Because if I'll tell no, you, no, what, no, that no, it's not. There's no. There's well, everything is. Yeah, I mean, right. So so that what we're talking about at that point is like. I, I guess my point is like if the body's hungry, you eat a sandwich. So yeah, but if, that's not what that's not what we're talking about. We're talking I, about the added on baggage of the because let me just say why I said that are is okay. because okay. let's say that you weren't attracted to the girl, to the woman, and she broke up with you, and you didn't have any of the emotion. It's the same. Right. It's the same story of breakup, but without that, this shouldn't be happening. I'm devastated. I miss her. With all, all that, with I, I'm just gonna say yes and no because that I, I feel I feel like we're getting into this. I feel like this is getting into a territory that's a little bit of a muddy blend of, you know, just basic you know, common sense kind of stuff and non-duality. Um, and, and, and it's not a bad thing to talk about this, but I think this is, um, th this is where like non-dual trauma work shines. Things like Byron Katie's The Work or Stephen Walensky or, you know, there's a lot of people out there who focus on that. And I, I think that there's a lot of value to that to um, really looking at the story in different ways and really being with the feeling in the body, these are ways that the character can um, dive into to travel lighter. You know, basically, in, in a sense, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess may, maybe, I, I, so at this point, rather than continue with this theoretical, this hypothetical example, um, you know, has there been any sort of, um, yeah, what, what are your own personal experiences and thoughts on these topics of trauma work from a non-dual perspective, a post-awakening perspective? What, what's your perspective on um, this, these words like embodiment, integration? Do you have any thoughts or feelings on any of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, for me, is no surprise probably, it's, it's very much like, you know, Jim Newman talks about a, applied non-duality 
like the me will try and apply non-duality. You've heard, you've heard Jim say that. It, well, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so therapy is fine. There's nothing wrong with therapy. If, if, if I have a, you know, eating disorder or I'm anxious all the time, certainly therapy can help calm the me and perhaps breathing exercises or meditation can be useful, but that, that is not to do with non-duality. Not to do it. Well, could, could I, well, going back to what I said earlier in the conversation, like everything is included in non-duality. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel like what you're, I mean, the, the, the fork in the road that I, I get to people in this area usually involves this, like, it, it's like what, what, I, what, I've, what I've heard from people in similar discussions is this skepticism of why would you be interested in talking about these things in association with non-duality, like, because that's kind of, um, it's like, it, it's giving this sense of that, it's like non-duality is not giving you a place to get. And it's not telling you if you, yeah, applied non-duality is like a oxymoron. Um, so, you know, Paul Hederman says, you know, that you can't use non-duality for duality. It'll fail you every time. And that's the best thing it can do. Yeah, you know? that's it. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. So, um, but it's not gonna, yeah. but art, it's not gonna stop the me from trying. I tried, every seeker will try. It's, you know, it's almost predictable, right? Cause it's, so I was sharing with Luciana, she asked me about the seeking and I said, yeah, I started off as, as a motivational speaker and wrote a 525 page book, Success Secrets of the Motivational Superstars. And I interviewed like the top 18 motivation in the country back in the late nineties. And at the time, you know, that was just what was going on because I was trying to figure out how these, you know, multimillionaire successful speakers were able to do it. And so that resonated until it didn't. And so there are no rules to this. So I agree with you. There is no rules to any of this. None. Life doesn't. What does life need rules for? <laughs> I mean, life seems to like govern itself, you know, life lives itself, everything is life flowing into life, you know, so the point at which you separate and say this is one thing and another thing sort of creates the, the story when there is no objective story, there's just the emergence of this life flowing into life, apparently, and, and that can manifest as anything. Um, but yeah, I guess, no, and I hear what you're saying. This is exactly what I mean. Like, yeah, the, the seeking energy, not getting you to non-duality realization, you know, which are just kind of nonsense words, you know, but seeing that there's nowhere to get, there's no me, and the peace that comes from that, the, the, the ordinary, simple, yeah. simple peace, and not needing something to be better as Jim said, not needing to be happy, you know, but that, but at the same time, like the actions go on of the body. And at what point you call it the body versus some seeking energy of a me that doesn't exist. I think that's entirely subjective. And so I don't think you could see from the outside necessarily what is I mean, everyone's just, it's there, I don't know what to, it, it's also that thing of like how, you know, like, like in traditional Vedanta, it's often said that like to an awakened one, everyone is awakened or everything is God, you know, there's no seeing of the seeker anymore. There's no seeing of the separate person. It's just like you're seeing God or self or nothing in everything and everyone, yeah. even if they don't see that in themselves, you know, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter. It's like what you see. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I would say these are, these are some areas of interest for me 
in a way, but um, but I yeah, but I don't feel the need to really discuss it further because I I I get your point, and um, yeah, it's like. Yeah, I would just say that to me, it doesn't seem like a seeking from a separate me. It seems more like getting a sandwich out of the fridge or part of travel, but in a way that's traveling lighter. It's not in a way where it's adding more to do's that bring suffering. It's the, quite the opposite. You know, I, I've met some very troubled individuals who focus nearly 24 seven on non-duality. And if they put one of those hours into you know, therapy or something, or maybe like playing soccer, you know, it probably like, you know, they travel a little lighter, you know, but, but I, but I don't want to fix them. It's okay. It's okay for everything to just be as it is. It can't be differently, but yeah, but this is my own passion in a way, just to speak about the, whatever's I'm talking about. Well, um, and I know we're probably getting to the end here, but the la last point I probably want to make is, you know, at the end of the day, none of this is actually knowable. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, this is this is life expressing itself. This is the barking of a dog, and you don't know what that means. Yeah, and and that's the the illusion of the me is it thinks it knows. And as you know, Jim says, once you have the, 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 and it's really counterintuitive that knowledge would be, you, you wouldn't suspect knowledge as the culprit. The needing to know leads to more needing to know, you know, endlessly, that there's no end to the needing to know. So once I know I'm here and I exist, now I got a whole bunch of questions. So this not knowing, you know? Well, I would say um, I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up the dreaded word levels one more time. And, <laughs> and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here pretty soon. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, the, um, the non-dual and the apparently dual level. So from the non-dual level, there's a lot of pointers here with the, knowledge leading to more knowledge, you know, and there, there is no separation, there's no doer. This is all non-dual expressions that are pointing to things that the words can't actually capture. Um, in, in this way, it's unknowable. The words seem to capture it superficially, but they don't, you know, and, and but on the dual level, you know, the body's hungry, it eats a sandwich. And, and I would just say like, there's a model that's been very um, interesting, just been interesting to me that, I, that I'm passionate about really, is this apparent, you know, masculine and feminine polarities of expression of non-duality and life in general, yin and yang, yin and yang, you know, it's, um, and, and so, you know, like there, there's the negative and positive expression of this. There's the traditional neti neti, not this, not this. You can't put this in words. And then there's the everything perspective of it's all of this. It's exactly your expression. There's nothing wrong with that expression. And so, yeah, that's, I just, that, that's what, what's resonant, what's, what's being spoken out of this mouth. That's the bark this dog is yap, yapping. Yep, yep, yep. Beautifully. Perfectly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's lovely. I think that, though, if you were to ask most me's, and I'll do this often at my Wednesday night, you know, Wednesday night at six o'clock on the uh, Pacific Coast time, Los Angeles time, I do a one hour Zoom non duality meeting where we, we go into it. And mine's actually more like yours, it's more communal. Everybody can share, everybody's invited, because my feeling is you really, this has to be seen for you. You have to see it yourself. So it doesn't matter what Ramana or Nisargadatta or Jim Newman or anyone else thinks. All that matters is what's your experience? 
Right. And, and, and the irony of that that I've found in having an environment like that is like sometimes someone will say to me like, wow, I love this group. I love the freedom to just that we're all exploring and expressing. And then like two months later, the person just leaves the group because we just don't see eye to eye about what they don't want to hear or say. I don't want to hear or say it. There are these natural parting of ways, you know, just like relationships can be like that. It's like water flowing down a mountain, you know, and it hits a rock. It goes one way or the other. These things happen, but all the water is flowing into the same ocean. Yeah, I would say if you ask, um, well, I don't see a distinction between duality and non-duality. Good. <laughs> I, I mean, well, I mean, good. Yeah. I, you know, what, well, it, it opens up to so much more. I, I originally wasn't sure if I was going to title these conversations Ocean to Ocean or Non-Dual Jazz. And this conversation feels to me more like a non-dual jazz conversation because it's like there are these moments of like interesting harmony and disharmony that beg to be resolved, but they don't even need to be. You know, it's like, it, that's the thing is like, there's harmony in the disharmony. In, in fact, harmony itself is disharmony. Like it, it, the history of music in the West it began with people singing in unison and octaves. So it was the same note. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then gradually disharmony was added piece by piece over the centuries. And that disharmony became the harmony. So I think these conversations are great because, you know, it, just like the one that people should look up if they would feel like it of Byron Katie and UG, the moments where they don't agree are beautiful because then you have to decide what resonates for you. Yeah. And at the deepest level, at the truest sense, there, yeah, there's no separation. Not duality is an, a total illusion. Non-duality is an illusion too. It's just a word, you know? But, but it, there's this feeling of, um, for here, of like wholeness and love and, yeah. Yeah, here there used to be somebody that thought they knew something. And and now I, I just, I can't really, I mean, I can ask you, maybe you know, I, I, I don't know anything for certain, do you? No, no, but, but the dog is gonna yap its sound regardless. The yapping doesn't stop here. Yeah, yeah it's just the song. Um, a song. Yeah, yeah, let's call it a song. That's, that's that sounds a little more a little nicer. <laughs> the the, the trump the, the saxophone solo, the guitar solo. I mean, you know, it, it's yeah, there's no knowing here. Absolutely no knowing. But on the apparent level, there's talking and there's just all this stuff. I mean, you call it whatever you want, but it's it's electrifying for me it, it, to hear people. Yeah, I don't know. It, it works to be boring. It doesn't matter. You know, it's silence is beautiful, but speaking there's silence in speech. Yeah. Well, since you, you, you love music. I, I love music too. Love watching video. I'm a big sixties and seven, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. That's my, I grew up in the sixties and seventies. So, um, yeah. So this is to me like, um, and this is just a story, but it's like everyone. This is an. This is like a, a full orchestra. So you're you're an instrument. The art instrument produces a sound. The Michael instrument over here produces. The bird produces. It's all the same one, with just countless instruments. Yeah of how it expresses. So you wouldn't expect a violin to sound like a trumpet. You wouldn't want them to sound the same. You want them to be unique. That's what I hear you saying, Art, is oh, the, the yeah. uniqueness is important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, that's, that's me. That's this character. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I value uniqueness, and I seem to be ha- seem to have been programmed to be that way. It has nothing to do with me. But yet, you, know? you still appreciate the silence because you know you couldn't have music or words without the space in between. So the silence is as important as the word. You can't have one without the other. You know. You, yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and and in a literal sense, there is no silence, which is very interesting. Like last night, there was a power outage here, and it was the most silent it had been, like ever since I've moved here, like a year and a half ago, and and it was so loud, so loud. I don't even know what I was hearing, but I was hearing so much. Wow, I was hearing my own tinnitus for one, but I was hearing a bunch of things. And it just sounded like an amazing orchestra of sound. There was in the silence. Wow. It was beautiful. That is beautiful. I, it's funny. I just happened to watch a video yesterday about, believe it or not, the making of Rolls Royces. Here you go. There's a real, <laughs> there's a real spiritual thing. Why are Rolls Royces? <laughs> so hey, hey, it's it's you're you're it, it, it's part of the the Osho lineage. So I think. It, <laughs> Well, here's the part that ties into what you just said. They had developed one of the things that makes the car so expensive, like 400 to 700,000 a car, 400,000 is a cheap one. And um, yeah, they had made the part of the reason it was so people, you know, liked them that could afford them was the quietness that it was like 10 layers of insulation or some, I forget the exact number, but they had made it really quiet, but then the technology on tires got better and they actually made the tires themselves. They put some kind of lining that made them quieter. So they said between the, when they added the new quieter tire, tires, the passenger experience was went down. It was actually too quiet and people were unnerved. So they actually removed some of the padding in the car to, <laughs> to raise the silence to a more acceptable level. Uh, that's so funny. That's so, f- yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great story. Yeah, you know, and you know what, these new electric cars, they're trying to figure out how to like the right kind of sounds for it to create artificially, digitally, since it doesn't have the natural sounds. Yeah, no, it's, well, what a wonderful talk, Michael. I I have a question I like to ask at the end. Um, What, what, what are some of your favorite things other than chess? And yeah. Um, I would say that's one of the things that dropped away was a, a, a particular, you know, um, and again, I hate to keep bringing his name up, but, um, you know, Tim o- often talks about his laziness since this, you know, calamity to bring UG back into it. Um, the, the, if you want to get a lot done in this world, this really is not the message for you because um, the me is great at doing, you know, building, um, designing, you know, all that. When the me isn't here, you may find that your mo- your motivation, like you sent me, I, 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 right? It's like the enneagram that you had sent just didn't resonate. I was like, I cannot answer all these questions because my mind turned to mush. Like I just complexity, just I I don't know. I just so I find that that's. The biggest difference for me is that this urge to have to do things, I, I tend to do the minimum, you know, just, you know, just if I need to mail a chess book that somebody bought on Amazon, I just send it, but I don't really give much thought to it. Um, you know, it's just a more simple, I want to say, existence. You don't need as much as you think. That's one of the things, the me thinks it needs a lot of things. If you have a roof over your head and some food and some water and a toilet, it can be enough. Definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, I, that expression of awakening of, you know, traveling lighter, I think is beautiful. I think it's not necessarily universal. You know, this goes back to the rose and the sunflower to me. I just want to make that point. I, I think it could be quite the opposite for others, you know. Oh, yeah. We, we, no, there's no We way. have no way to. Yeah. yeah. No, it's just, just what works for you. You know, figure out, we all want to find our own voice. That's what you're doing. You're finding out your voice. You know, it took me a while to figure out sort of what's Michael's. You know, but it's not. But it's not a seeking to find. It's just the voice. You know, th I think this is where the metaphor of the thousand petal lotus comes from because it's just always unfolding. There's just like on the level of a parent, what you see and experience with the body. There's always change in the universe, and yet, you know, this message is about that which has no change, that which you are this just already perfect and whole and impossible to change. So, yeah, I, 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 was, I was, yeah, I was hoping you'd say something a little bit more just down to earth, like, like a movie, you, like, I don't know, like, like you like to watch movies, like when you're lazy, what do you like? What are your favorite things to engage in when you're lazy? Just sitting silently or be going to the park or swimming? Yeah. Or well, um just taking walks, getting some exercise, getting off, you know, my butt and getting out and getting some sun and fresh air, just really simple. You know, the wind, um, I enjoy watching the butterflies dance on the flowers and I get lost in, <laughs> in I do. They, they're so no, it, fragile. No, I, I, I can totally relate, Michael. And yeah, no, that's a beautiful note to end on. You know, it really is enough. I mean, like I look outside my window and there's these trees and sky and what's better? Yeah, and you know, I was talking to this, somebody yesterday about, I forget who I was talking to, me and my sister. I was saying something about when someone asked you what you're doing this weekend, I remember I was back when the, used to get our haircuts when the place was open. Um, the girl says, so what are you doing this weekend? And I said, nothing. And I had never done that because I, you know, like all of us, I had felt the social pressure to come up with something interesting and clever. Oh yes, I'm, you know, going to see the Rolling Stones tonight in San Diego, you know, at Petco Field, you know. Now I feel like I don't, there's no one to impress. Nobody really cares. You know, when you realize all me's are really interested in me, that you're free to be however you, you know. Totally. Like freedom for no reason. Freedom, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the beautiful anarchy of this life being what it is. What did Shakespeare say about noise and sound and fury signifying yeah. nothing? Yeah. Now oh. that, that is a good way to end a nothing.com interview. I, I I agree. Yeah. Nothing.fm. But yes, yes. Yeah, we're it's all sound and fury for nothing. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful sound and fury signifying nothing. Yeah. Beautiful sound and fury. Yeah, no less beautiful. No more beautiful. You know, it's the extraordinary ordinary. Oh this was I a just, great talk. Thank you. All right, I just thought of something else I really love. Do you like thunderstorms? I love them. Yes, me. That's what I'm saying. Like a getting lost in a thunderstorm because we don't get them very often here in LA. So when there's Same light, here. Same yeah, here, yeah. When there's lightning in a thunderstorm, I don't know. I just I no words. Yeah.
<clears throat> yeah, that, yeah. Simple, lighter, just human, basic human stuff. Yeah. Life, basic life stuff. Yeah. No need for anything extra. Yeah. Or for it to be different or better. Blah, 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 blah. I love you, Michael. This was a great talk. Oh, thank you. I love you too, Art. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. It, it was an honor and really a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Me too.